This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by TopTal. Experience a new way of hiring as TopTal delivers only the top 3% of applicants, including highly skilled blockchain engineers. If you're looking to scale your team with the very best talent, visit toptal.com slash epicenter. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Cuccio. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. How's it going, Brian? Yeah, it's very good. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so actually, uh, as we're recording this, uh, I'm in your hometown. I'm here in Basel, and apparently not too far from where you grew up, which is kind of interesting. And uh, just want to mention that over the course of the next few weeks, uh, I'm going to be releasing some content that uh, I recorded here, some some interviews uh, with some of the key members of the Hyperledger community, uh, and also Brian Bellendorf, who we had on the show a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so uh, look for those interviews on our YouTube channel and also uh, you know, we'll be tweeting them out, of course, and like sharing them on our social channels. Uh, but yeah, it's a great conference and uh, I'm really happy that uh, Hyperledger invited me, uh, or the Linux Foundation, sorry, invited me to, uh, to come out here and do these interviews. It's, uh, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a little you know, welcome change from the, the other side of things, which is sort of like the dev cons and permissionless systems. Uh, here we're seeing a lot of you know, enterprise, uh, other guys in suits. Uh, very different vibe from, from dev con, I must say. <laughs> but um, yeah, so today we're speaking with uh, David Andolfado, who is a researcher at the St. Louis Federal Reserve. And we had David on uh, years ago to talk about uh, FedCoin. And so today... Uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to speak with him again, and we talked about a number of things, uh, including, you know, sort of like the sort of space and how it's evolved since we last spoke, the, 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 the idea of central bank digital currencies. Uh, we also talked about um, his a recent paper that he wrote about the impact of central bank digital currencies uh, on the banking sector and touch on some other sort of interesting high level economic uh, theorizing about uh, you know sort of the tokenization of liquidity. So here's our interview with David Andolfado. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Crane. We're here today with David Andolfado. Uh, he was on the podcast before. Actually, we just checked before. And it's been three and a half years, so a long time. Um, last time we talked about FedCoin, which was, uh, you know, basically the idea of how could the central bank, like the Federal Reserve, issue its own cryptocurrency. I think a lot of people were like, what is this horrendous idea? So, uh, yeah, today, of course, in the meantime, lots of things have happened. And we're really excited to have David back on to speak a little bit about, you know, some of the, these ideas back then and the activities around central banking and federal uh, and cryptocurrencies. And, and some of the other research topic that he's been working on. So thanks so much for coming on, David. That's my pleasure. Thanks. So yeah, we, you before mentioned, well, fortunately, not much has happened. So so let's come <laughs> to that. Uh, let's come to that question. Since the last time we spoke, and I think at the time, you know, there was hardly anybody from a central bank writing about Bitcoin and writing about crypto. Uh, it's become lots of activity. So what do you think are the most important developments in the last three years when it comes to you know, kind of central banking and cryptocurrencies? Well, I think in terms of central banking, I, um, I'd probably say uh, the most important development from my perspective is just a, a greater awareness of the possibility of the central bank, a central bank becoming more directly involved in issuing digital money to uh, to regular people and not just limiting the privilege to a, a set number of, of banks. Give, give us a bit of, a, of an overview, I guess, from your perspective, sort of what is the, the state of research and you know, maybe specific projects being developed in the area of central bank digital currencies? Well, I guess uh, a lot of that answer will depend on exactly how we define digital currencies. You know, I, I think that the research is is multifaceted. I mean, there's there's a lot more to digital currencies than just currencies, as you know. Uh, it, it basically has to do with uh, database management. So I'm aware of efforts throughout central banks in studying kind of broader applications of, of say, distributed ledger or blockchain technologies. 
Uh, there's considerable amount of research being done trying to study the uh, financial market implications of this emergent technology, what impact that might have for uh, regulatory policy going forward or central bank uh, policy going forward. And then there's uh, uh, some, some, some work actually you know, asking the question of whether or not the central bank itself might uh, enter into the space and issue its own form of digital currency. And this primarily is in the form of what I would call just digital money, not necessarily a crypto asset, uh, like a, a digital token, but more of like just a regular account-based money that is available to uh, non-banked individuals. Uh, so I guess I guess uh, on, on that side we're we're talking about like this sort of realm of digital currencies um, from uh, like all all across the spectrum, right? So from having uh, a digital ledger uh, which is based on you know, a centralized database model, or uh, more of an account based system uh, like the ones that we see in cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Uh, and on the other hand, we also have like central banks' positions on decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. With regards to the to the latter, uh, and you did say that there has been a, a broadening of awareness, uh, how are central banks now looking at the, the, the public permissionless cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum? Has there been a change of opinions with regards to how things were, uh, you know, three or four years ago? A change in opinion? Um... I would characterize it more as a ch not a change. There were, was really no opinion before. Uh, and that's not just in central banking, but almost everywhere. Because I would say as of three years ago, the last time we spoke, not many people really understood what the underlying technology was and what, what it was delivering relative to uh, existing uh, protocols of, in database management. Central banks, uh, central bank researchers uh, have uh, become more aware of the underlying uh, technology, as has everybody else. And so I, I would say that the way the opinion, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, <laughs> generalize because, um, you know, what we're talking about here are individual researchers sprinkled throughout the research divisions of central banks around the world. And there could be a wide variety of opinions out there. But I would say that for the most part, uh, central bankers, you know, being trained economists, uh, for the most part are highly skeptical of the endeavor in terms of uh, providing at least uh, a digital currency. Uh, there may be 10 percent, I mean, from what I've seen, kind of are kind of less skeptical. So <laughs> but by and large, there's a, a skepticism of the role that a private money might play or a uh, to displace a, a well-managed kind of state money. That's kind of how my measure of what the attitude is of at this stage. So the skepticism, what's the, what are the biggest things that make central bankers so skeptical of cryptocurrencies? Well, um, I would say that uh, a combination of things uh, to be generous. Uh, you know, I think that one way to think about it is, uh, you know, the skepticism is is based on kind of this our historical experience. This is with private money issues. Um, they haven't often uh, turned out particularly well. Now, in fairness, it's really hard to assess uh, uh, the historical uh, data because there's so much going on. Uh, the interaction of of uh, regulations with the private money provision. So it's very hard to tell sometimes whether the, it's the private provision of the, of the money supply that should be criticized vis-a-vis -vis the underlying regulation that prevents it from operating well. But by and large, um, you know, there's just this, 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 this intuitive feel based on the data. You know, if we look at the so-called free banking era in the United States that ran from about 1836 to 1863, and what you saw was just literally thousands of different monies issued by thousands of different banks. And, uh, you know, this, the, the system didn't, it functioned, and it, by some measures it functioned relatively well. But, you know, there's just a great inconvenience of having these different private monies coexisting, circulating, there's counterfeiting problems, etc. Um, so, 
rightly or wrongly, I think that uh, a large amount of the skepticism uh, just comes from based on what we have seen in the history of private money provision. That's very interesting, you know. So we have, because we have this technology, right? And, and I think people in the blockchain space are very like forward-looking, say, "Oh, this is something totally new. It's revolutionary. <laughs> it's never been seen before." Uh, and the technology is so much at the center. And then you have maybe like people looking at it from a central bank in this historical perspective and saying, "Like, oh, but it's similar to the thing in the 1800s, you know, in the private banking area," and then kind of applying that framework on it. So it feels like a very big. Uh, very big difference, no, in terms of the the perspective brought to the topic. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, it's it's almost a universal truth that almost there's almost nothing new uh, when you look around. There's there's some some example we can or examples we can draw on in history that are very close, and this is no different. Uh, you know, finan- fintech financial innovations have been with us all the time from the beginning of recorded history. Uh, you know, the invention of the checking account, for example, uh, that largely replaced uh, small denomination bank paper notes. Uh, you know, this is a database management technology, and it was facilitated with the use of wire communications and, you know, and techniques for storing the data. Um, basically, what we see today is kind of more or less the same thing uh, as I've written about before, but kind of on a, on a much broader scale just because of the innovations we have in communications, storage capacity, and also uh, you know, cryptography and things like that. That's interesting. I, I, find, this, I find this a bit puzzling. So, so you, you think really that generally the best way to predict the future is to you know, sort of say, okay, how is it similar to some episode in the past, and then use that? Well, let me put it to you this way. Think about what Bitcoin is fundamentally, and blockchain more generally, what it is fundamentally. And I think, to my view, it is a database management system. Money is one example of a ledger, of a ledger system, you have it's information that is stored in accounts, and you need a way to manage that account, those accounts, keep the data secure, and to manage the information flow across accounts, the debits and credits of money across accounts. This is database management. It's very important, but it's nothing new. And so you know, in that sense, we can look to history because this, this database management problem is around us everywhere, not just in monetary systems, but as you know, supply chains, for example, or, uh, you know, the relationships between suppliers and uh, their, their customers and so on. Um, big, big issues. They're perennial issues. So in that sense, nothing new. What is new? What is new are the emergent technologies that facilitate communications. We can now speak by phone or communicate over the internet. We can now store data more securely and in larger quantities. These are the innovations that lead to innovations in these database management systems. These are the innovations that permit a wonderful technology like Bitcoin to emerge. Uh, And no one can really predict exactly what's going to happen but at the same time, one can appreciate that the fundamental problem is always the same. It's database management. How do you keep the data secure? And, you know, how do you read and write to the database, keep the data secure, and make sure that there's easy uh, and widespread access to the database or to the constituents that you're trying to target? So, I mean, I certainly agree with you, right? Like, you can look at Bitcoin, and this is a perfectly fair description of Bitcoin, but I feel like you can also have, you know, a different way of looking at Bitcoin, right? You could say Bitcoin is kind of like this, this is term decentralized autonomous organization, right? So you have, in a way, all of these different players and the miners and the developers and the users and the exchanges, and there is no central organism, yet they somehow all coordinate this, like, massive system, and it evolves in some way, right? So there's this... So, so that's something that feels pretty novel to me. Do you, do no. you see? No. 
No, I mean, uh, it doesn't sound novel to me at all. In fact, it, I've, I've written on this saying it sounds like the most ancient thing that I can think of. It's called, uh, you know, decentralized, uh, you know, communal behavior. Little communes, little hunter-gather societies operate on this principle uh, of not having any centralized authority, but people getting together and communally deciding on how to manage the, the societal history for the uh, general prosperity of the of the tribe. This principle is not new at all. Again, what is new is the technology that permits this idea of communal record keeping to scale on a global scale. That is new, but the underlying principle is not new at all. Yeah, I was, I was just going to get to that. Is that the, way, the way that I perceive blockchain in this context, and whether that be cryptocurrencies or permission networks or what have you, is that they are essentially you know, governance mechanisms that attempt to apply governance to sort of human interaction at scale and governance of human interaction at scale sometimes gets complex. So if you look at like democracy as a governance mechanism, you know, there are definitely advantages to it, but there's also issues with democracy. Once you get to a certain point, um, you know, corporate structures also have their advantages and like their, their, their fail points. And so to me, blockchain is a, a, a type of governance mechanisms that governance mechanism that allows you to scale that also has its uh, its advantages and points where, where where it might fail and and it's sort of finding the balance between you know what are you, what do you most care about do you care about user experience or privacy or uh, the ability to have a governance that's more decentralized or less decentralized and you sort of have to pick you know some of these and you know, find the right balance for your application you know Bitcoin has went a certain way and Ethereum might go another way or you know a permission network where you know you have, you're, you're dealing with a known set of actors might uh, interact in a different way, much like our societies interact in different ways when thinking about governance. <laughs> yeah, I think that's exactly the right way to think about it. Uh, uh, I, you know, there's database management is a problem. There's many problems, many many different. You know, there's no one solution fits all the problems. Uh, and so it depends on what the constituency is looking for in terms of the properties of the database management system. And as you mentioned, if some, you know, if, if the uh, decentralized record keeping is, is something that uh, the constituents find desirable, uh, then kind of a blockchain structure kind of sounds like the type of database management system that could better serve their needs. But for a lot of people, that's just not important. For a lot of people, uh, they're very willing to trust delegated record keepers, trusted historians, if you like, to manage uh, the data. Uh, but by and large, I kind of see room for coexistence here. I don't see why it necessarily has to be one thing or the other. I think that, as always, we see coexistence to fit the various niche uh, demands of the constituents. Okay, so then I, I would like to maybe bring it a sort of different, uh, different way a different blockchain direction and, and, and hear your take on that. So if you look at Ethereum, right, there's this idea of a world computer where anybody can write their application on it and it can it's interoperable with other applications. And, you know, I can create my application and it interrupts with yours, but we don't know each other. We don't trust each other. Uh, anyone can kind of deploy it on there. Uh, it, you know, it's kind of global censorship resistance. So people now doing, you know, whether that's lending or derivatives or these kind of organizational structures or issuing all kinds of assets to games. Does that not feel like something like really radically revolutionary novel that just is not comparable to something we've had in the past? <laughs> you're, you're really searching for something <laughs> truly uh, <laughs> novel. So, um, so let's think about it here. Uh, you know, this this notion of a decentralized autonomous organization sounds pretty cool. Uh, and I don't mean cool and necessarily in a good way. It's, it's either really exciting or it could be very frightening, too, if you start thinking about it. Um, can I, off the top of my head, draw some analogy from history? I mean, what do we got here? Decentralized autonomous organization is just basically uh, yeah, there's, there's no central authority. So that's that's OK. Um, yeah. Well, you got me on this one. Maybe maybe there is something, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we basically have the prospect of uh, 
robots governing how contractual terms are executed. You know, uh, some sort of uh, contract that, you know, we could write up on the code and share. We write a, a contract. I don't know you. You don't know me. We can write the terms of the contract. The terms of the contract can be executed on kind of publicly available information. And the terms are going to be contracted whether uh, they're going to be executed, whether we like it or not. I mean, that's, that's I guess, something that uh, sounds very new. Uh, and, and in any case, it certainly is something that's feasible with this, this new technology. And I think it's exactly uh, that area that I think is, is uh, the decentralized autonomous organization that I think we'll be seeing policymakers are going to be starting to open their eyes a lot more to that dimension of the of this endeavor because I I think that actually potentially this that part of it is is likely to have the most profound implications for society. Yeah, that I very much agree with, and, and of course you're absolutely right that with any powerful new thing there is the upsides and the downsides, and and certainly those ex with DAOs it's uh, very absolutely uh, possible to imagine uh, you know quite horrendous ways this could be used as well as wonderful ways it could mm. be used yes. so uh, there's no and, and i i think it could be a perfectly reasonable stance in my view to say okay i see those possibilities and i see the good the good possibilities and the bad one and for me i i you know i i think the bad ones are maybe too likely or too bad so that i'm overall against this i think that's a, you know a reasonable position to have I'm glad to hear that you think I'm reasonable. <laughs> Hiring is stressful. Let's face it, it's a long process of sifting through resumes and interviewing candidates without any guarantee of quality. But it doesn't have to be this way. Companies all over the place are experiencing a new way of hiring with TopTal. If you go to their Trustpilot page, you'll see that of the hundreds of people that have left reviews, over 98% were four or five star ratings, including one guy who wants to give his developer a bear hug. That says a lot. TopTal gets all this great feedback because they focus on their clients and their top priority is quality. They only accept the top 3% of applicants, including highly skilled blockchain engineers. One of these engineers is Radek Ostrowski. Radek has experience as a lead software engineer and data scientist for Sony and Expedia. Then he discovered blockchain and he became totally consumed with Ethereum. He worked as a consultant for the firm StartOnChain and his time-locked app won the top quarter consensus uPort and Identity blockchain hackathon. Then he expanded his reach through TopTal. He worked with a bunch of clients on projects such as smart contract development and a POC that leverages blockchain. If you want to hire engineers like Radek for your team, go to toptal.com slash epicenter for a no risk trial. A TopTal director of engineering will deliver your next hire in as fast as 48 hours, and you'll get a thousand dollar credit when you decide to hire. We'd like to thank TopTal for their support of Epicenter. Before you move on to uh, to uh, the next topic, which is uh, this this paper that was recently released, I, I wanted to ask you your thoughts about. Uh, so, in in the Bitcoin space, there are some people that throw around the idea that central banks um, should and and government entities uh, should start holding crypto uh, in their reserves. We'd like to get your thoughts on this. If you think that's a good idea or something desirable or not at all. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, that's. It's interesting. I, I'd like to know. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I personally think that central banks around the world should uh, should start stocking up on reserves on my own personal IOUs. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I guess the point of that really terrible joke is to ask what is motivating people saying things like that. It sounds like they're just trying to generate some sort of additional demand for something that they're heavily invested in. The idea of a central bank holding reserves in in uh, some security like uh, like crypto or Bitcoin, to be specific, uh, to me seems kind of strange. I'm not sure why. I mean, maybe, maybe not central banks, but but perhaps government entities that typically would hold um, you know uh, uh, currencies of other countries uh, in reserves, or you know gold, or or perhaps some sort of uh, of, uh, of security. Uh, to hedge against risk or to, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but, you know, you, I think you get my, the idea. Yeah, yeah. I guess, 
I mean, I have to say, I, I don't think that that's a particularly good idea. But, but I mean, we kind of live in, in second best world or maybe even third best world. So could I imagine scenarios where that might make sense? And I guess I can. I mean, one scenario would be, for example, if you're living in a country that permitted, say, banks to issue liabilities denominated in Bitcoin. It's perfectly feasible. I mean, banks could you know, potentially uh, denominate their, their deposits or make their loans denominated in whatever they want, it, legislation permitting. Now, I would actually argue for legislation, legislation that would prevent that from happening, at least for banks that had access to um, deposit insurance or the lender of last resort facility at a central bank. But imagine you're living in a country where... For whatever reason, banks are permitted to write uh, uh, loans uh, and issue deposits denominated in Bitcoin. Then, well, we have a lot of historical experience of what happens with these types of structures. Just replace Bitcoin with gold. What you get is the possibility of these bank runs. In, fract in fractional reserve banking systems, the banks collectively are not going to have enough gold or Bitcoin uh, to make good on their obligations. And so, <laughs> you know, you could imagine... A, uh, a government wanting or instructing banks to hold sufficient uh, Bitcoin reserves if they're going to get into the business of issuing Bitcoin denominated liabilities. So th those are a lot of ifs. I mean, if, if, if. Uh, but whether government should get involved in this uh, as a matter of principle, I don't know. I could argue against. I mean, you could say, listen, if you're a bank and you want to get into this business, get into this business, but, you know, make sure that either you hold 100 percent Bitcoin back, uh, make, you know, hold sufficient reserves of Bitcoin uh, or, you know, th then the threat is if you get into trouble, we're not going to bail you out. But uh, the problem with governments is that they can never commit to those <laughs> those those promises. And so I just think it's a bad idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess let me let me sort of try to articulate what I think is the position, and yeah, I think basically the position is, and and you will probably disagree with this, that okay, Bitcoin, you know, is is gonna grow, and more and more people will use it, and it will become this you know digital gold thing, right? That's held by many uh, you know individuals, and that you know so over time that you may have a kind of erosion off of the, the, the value and the trust that some people have in fiat currencies and it will increasingly shift to Bitcoin and so that then it will be, you know, important for central banks to have, you know, in their thing backing their currency have, you know, Bitcoin reserves just like they have maybe gold reserves today and that then there could be some sort of mechanism where, you know, this if, if, if let's just say that the different central banks believe that there is a, a, a some good chance of that happening, and you know if it happens, it will have some effect on the Bitcoin price. That you then have the incentive to be basically a first mover and say, okay, I'm going to go ahead because then I'm, I'm on a relative basis, you know, better off than the other central banks. And so, yeah, yeah, maybe. But you know, uh, my view is if a central bank can't be trusted to manage the domestic money supply in a responsible manner, they should get out of the business and just let Bitcoin take over. Just let private banking take over. Um, so why why should the central bank uh, intervene by by buying up Bitcoin when it's, it has the power to create its own money and manage it responsibly on its own? Um, buying up Bitcoin uh, doesn't necessarily endow the bank with any magical uh, management prowess. Uh, so I, I just think it's wrong. Um, either... The central bank can be trusted to manage the money supply responsibly, and, and this is oftentimes a very complicated thing because the way it interacts with the fiscal authority. But this should be just all up to ultimately to the voters uh, of, of the jurisdiction. And, and if it turns out that the central banks and fiscal authorities cannot be trusted to manage the money supply in this manner, that then I think naturally these, these other competitors like Bitcoin or gold or whatever, uh, will provide the substitutes that people want that are better managed. But I, I don't see any reason for why the central bank should <laughs> dabble in the in Bitcoin reserves. So uh, moving on to the next topic, uh, we want to talk about your paper, 
uh, which came out in October. It is titled uh, Assessing the Impact of Central Bank Digital Currency on Private Banks. Um, by digital currency, I presume here uh, you're talking about uh, digital currencies of the crypto flavor. And so, you know, why does how, how does this paper build on your previous research topics with regards to central bank cryptocurrencies? Well, uh, so cryptocurrencies, again, this is more of uh, I, I make the distinction between what I call like digital money and digital cash, I guess. Uh Digital money, we already have digital money. We use digital money all the time. Debit card transactions, most of our transactions are done with digital money. We have bank accounts. Uh, and the idea of central bank digital currency is the idea of instead of having a, a, a bank a digital money account with a regular chartered bank, why not permit people to just open up bank accounts with the central bank directly? That's what I mean by central bank digital money. One could go uh, one step further and have the central bank or some other entity issue what I call digital cash, which kind of has more of the, uh, the token aspect to it. But that would be distinguished simply by, um, you know, I think the analog would be like, imagine the central bank permitting users to open up kind of anonymous Swiss style bank accounts. So in, in that scenario, people would be sending uh, money from account to account and were, are, would be relatively anonymous, as opposed to the system we have today where you'd have to identify yourself, you identify your account number, and you know that I'm sending money to you. So my paper was really about central bank digital currency, uh, which is, I, I think, probably the empirically more relevant case, because I don't think a lot of uh, central banks will be willing to experiment with the notion of issuing, you know, the equivalent of digital cash just for a lot of uh, regulatory concerns like uh, know your customer requirements or anti-money laundering uh, rules. And so the purpose of this paper was to kind of say, look, if you take a look at the way the payment system is structured in the United States today, there seems to be uh, kind of two classes of individuals, you know, agencies, I guess. On the one hand, you have these big, powerful depository institutions, these private banks that have access, that can hold accounts directly with the Federal Reserve Bank. These accounts are interest-bearing accounts. They presently earn something like 2% interest. They, uh, the banks can send money um, between themselves using Fedwire, which is a real-time gross settlement system. So you can send money instantaneously. And there's like trillions of dollars that, that, uh, that flow through the system every day. And moreover, the banks, it costs almost nothing to operate this, this database management system. It, it, it's basically free as far as the big banks are concerned. So this is the banks on the one hand. And on the other hand, you have kind of the retail uh, experience, the one that, that I have to go through or... or um, or you know, some small business, for example, they either have to use cash, which is very costly. I mean, it's filthy. Um, it takes a lot of you know resources to uh, keep it secure, to transport it securely to a bank, to deposit it. Um, it's subject to theft, for example. Uh, if if instead you want to use a, a digital money, uh, you have all these interchange fees you have to pay. I mean, and this can, can often be a significant fraction of, of the sale. So in contrast to these big banks that pay basically nothing for instantaneous payments, you got a small business person who's working on very small margins. They have to pay these big interchange fees and the, and the payments don't clear for two or three days. It's on, it's on a completely separate, uh, the ACH system that was basically developed in the 1970s. So this proposal in this paper is to say, listen, what if we kind of combine, what if we permit these, the regular, you know, retail people to have access to interest bearing central bank digital money where the payments clear uh, instantaneously on a real time gross settlement system? Why don't we do that? And the, the answer one often gets is that there are some, uh, you know, there's some <laughs> 
I guess, constituencies in the economy that are, are very opposed to that sort of system. And, and, and typically, they're the incumbent banks. People uh, argue that these banks are going to be worried about whether or not they're going to be uh, losing business. Somehow it's going to you know, uh, disintermediate them in some manner. You know, what if everybody moves their money to the central bank, for example? What's that going to do for, for, for banks who are, who are interested in funding their investments? And so the purpose of my paper was to kind of study that question formally in the context of an economic model where you had basically monopoly banks. And that's very different than what's commonly done. What's commonly done in this literature is to assume that the, the banking sector is competitive, which is, I mean, everybody knows it's not quite competitive, but, you know, the other extreme is to, to, to think of it as being more oligopolistic or more monopolistic. And that's what I do in my paper. I argue that that's a much better approximation of the of the current U.S. banking system. And then I asked the question of what happens if the central bank introduces a an interest-bearing digital money instrument for the masses, what effect does this have on, on, on the lending activities of monopolistic banks and also uh, and their profits, basically? And what does it do in terms of financial inclusion? And what I find in the paper is that, not surprisingly, the introduction of this central bank digital currency increases financial inclusion because it, it makes it more attractive to hold interest-bearing digital money at the central bank instead of the zero interest bearing paper stuff that the that that you know relatively poor people are now kind of forced to hold so one it increases financial inclusion it makes you know the regular depositor better off it has no effect on the ability of banks to fund their investments i think that's a striking uh, result so for banks who are arguing that's going to impinge on their ability to fund investments, I think that that's a very questionable uh, claim that they're making. And then finally, what I find is not surprisingly that it cuts into bank profits. But it cuts into bank profits, but it makes kind of everybody else better off, and it doesn't impinge on the bank's lending activity. So that's basically the upshot of the paper was to... I, try to identify, at least in the context of a simple model, kind of what the likely impacts or repercussions of introducing a central bank currency would be on the incumbent banking system. The conclusion is basically, don't worry about it. <laughs> <At least. laughs> For us, the banks will have lower profits, but central bank and, and governments are not put in power to maximize the well-being of incumbent banks. They're, they're put into place to maximize the well-being of the broader population. So I say on those grounds, that would justify, this paper justifies that type of intervention. So there's a lot to, to unpack here. And it, it's a really interesting paper. I mean, I, so the it, it, it does also uh, describe this model uh, that, that, you're, that you talk about uh, in, in, in a very mathematical form. So if, uh, you know, for those who are not uh, uh, very comfortable with reading you know, lots of mathematical formulas and, and mathematical models, um, this might not be the paper for you, but you, you've you described it and, and, and summed it up very, uh, very nicely. I, I would like to come back to just, just sort of the notion of, of digital currencies at central bank and sort of the spectrum that we have there. So on, on one hand, we have something that's quite familiar, I guess, which is uh, you know, akin to having a bank account, right? So there's a there's a ledger. It's 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 privately owned and privately managed, and that ledger has a, a set of accounts, and those accounts have balances. Uh, only instead of having that ledger at uh, a bank, right, like uh, like like Chase or Wells Fargo or BNP or whatever, it's with the central bank. So essentially, rather than holding cash and uh, money that you have on this private ledger, this 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 money, this digital money, is held with the central bank, and then there are, there may be gradients of that, and these are theoretical, of course, where you get to a point where perhaps a central bank has some sort of a DLT style or blockchain style digital currency, where essentially the the central bank would be sort of the, the only node, and and what what's interesting with with this idea. And I think this is probably what we discussed in, in our last conversation, is that here you sort of have permissionless innovation on top. So the wallets, the applications that you can build on on top of these 
on top of this theoretical central bank cryptocurrency, the innovation is is opened up for sort of anyone to partake in. Can you clarify what you said? You said there's a single node? Uh, right, where the, where, the, where the central bank essentially does is using clearing? an open... Right, is the, does the clearing, but it, it, it's, it's an open source stack of technology so that one can build applications on top. So regardless of where, you, where one thinks of on the spectrum, um, the, the paper addresses sort of the more general idea of, okay, a, a central bank has accounts where individuals, companies, you know, small and large, can hold balances there. And, and in fact, since our last conversation, this is something that I thought about quite a bit and talked with people about, and it, it sort of opened my mind to like the role the central banks play um, in, our, in our economy and, and also the role the banks play. And one, one thing that I find really interesting about this is that having you know, opening opening accounts to individuals and businesses at central banks effectively renders some of the activities of a bank obsolete uh, apart, aside from the lending part um, I believe yeah so if this was the case if, if you if you could have um, a an account with a bank a uh, central bank rather as an individual and that that account was generating two percent interest. What 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 is the scenario? What, like what does that look like uh, in in terms of the more the, like broader economy? What is the effect that that has on the economy as a whole? Yeah, yeah. You know, the, this is uh, this is uh, something uh, that ongoing research is trying to answer. Okay, so uh, the the short answer we don't know for sure. And of course, my paper was just an example of trying to chip away at that to, to under, try to understand what the likely effects might be, some of the likely effects might be. Um, you know, if I, if I had a guess... Um, but yeah, let's hypothesize that yeah. all of a sudden, yeah. people don't hold savings in banks anymore. Well, savings okay. are no longer Well, but banks. back up a second. I mean, that's not necessarily the assumption you want to make. Um, the assumption you want to make is suppose that the central bank offers a competing product that banks do. Now, now first of all, we have to think about this. I mean, I have in mind something kind of modeled more like the old U.S. postal savings system. And, and this is an old idea. Many countries have postal savings banks. And the idea is that the, the, the government is getting involved in providing a very basic utility service. It's not a full service account. It's just a basic plain vanilla bank, uh, bank account that could potentially pay interest, very low fees, fully insured, and it just that you make payments. You just pay people using your phone or whatever. Now you're charging interest on that, so banks are going to have to compete, compete against that product. And the way they're going to compete against it is is one of two ways. They're going to like start raising the interest rate on the deposit accounts they offer you to attract your business. But they 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 are more likely to to attract uh, try to compete away compete on the basis of kind of non-interest bearing benefits. There's a whole bunch of other services that banks offer. So they'll, they'll get into the full service bank account. They might offer insurance on the side. There's, there's all sorts of things that the, uh, you know, that the, the banks might still profitably be able to do, even though this, this basic utility service central bank digital currency is available. So I, I don't think it's necess you're necessarily going to see deposits flocking from the private banking sector into the central bank. You might see some, and the fact that the central bank is, is paying interest on these deposits uh, might, is likely to force the private banks to offer better terms to depositors. Because if you take a look right now, take a look at right now since 2015 when the Fed started raising its interest rate, and take a look at what's happened to deposit rates in the United States. They've basically remained zero. Even though the interest on reserves, the interest rate that the Federal Reserve pays banks is at 200 basis points. At the same time, you see the lending rates uh, that banks are charging have gone up appreciably. I think the lending rate on uh, home secured loans is something like 600 basis points. So they're making that big spread. So... My view is that if nothing else, even if, if nobody comes over to the central bank, 
the very threat of the central bank offering a, a 2% you know, interest-bearing account would be sufficient to induce the banks to compete. And so they'll be forced to compete to keep the deposits. And this will show up as a higher interest rate on our, on our accounts and better service ultimately as they compete to keep our accounts. Cool. So uh, I want to ask a sort of related scenario, which may seem outlandish to you. But uh, but maybe not, right? I think we talked about it a little bit last time, maybe. So, I mean, let's say now, because right today we have this fractional reserve system, mm -hmm. right? So where you have, uh, you know, banks can basically create more dollars, right? And you have this deposit and, and, and Bitcoin in a way is like a full reserve system, right? So mm -hmm. there's... You know, you have a Bitcoin, you have a Bitcoin, like I can't give you or nobody can really issue sort of, you know, fractional reserve Bitcoin or when it happens, it's considered a fraud, right? Like, let's say on Mt. Gox, you could say there was some sort of a fractional reserve Bitcoin system at, at one point. So why not create, uh, you know, full reserve U.S. dollar system, right? So there's no fractional, like, let's say you made a cryptocurrency and it's the U.S. dollar cryptocurrency and... Anybody can check the ledger, right? So you send me some some US dollar, I can check on the ledger and say, like, okay, this is you know real US dollar. So it, it wouldn't make any sense for anybody to accept some sort of fractional, uh, you know, fractionally backed US dollar. What do you think of that? Is that a good idea? Well, in fact, the the central bank digital currency that I propose is essential a variant of that, right? The accounts that you're holding are 100% backed. Uh, there's no fractional reserve uh, banking there, uh, but the the basic idea that you're uh, you're you're espousing right now is an old idea. It's just called narrow banking, the narrow banking proposal or or full reserve banking proposal. Uh, it's called the Chicago Plan. If you take a look at the literature, there was a big proposal I think in the 1930s from the University of Chicago, uh, making exactly this point. The idea that Fractional reserve banking should be separated from the payments system. And what that basically means is that if you're a bank and you're in the business of processing payments, you better make sure that these liabilities that you've issued, these deposit liabilities, are fully backed with reserves, either in the form of gold, could be Bitcoin, uh, government treasuries, whatever. They have to be fully backed. And that the credit market should operate separately from the banking system. I honestly don't know where I come down on this idea because uh, I'm still exploring kind of the history and also the theory here. Uh, the idea of fractional reserve banks is not inherently a bad idea. I mean, the, the question is, is what are banks doing when they're issuing fractional reserves? You know, when they go to you, uh, you know, to either, you know, when they go to you and make you a loan, what are they doing? They're creating money out of thin air, and they're giving it to you. What they're, in effect, doing is monetizing your human capital. They're giving you credit. They're saying, you know what, Brian, you know what, Sebastian? We believe in you. Here's the money. And by the way, it happens to be redeemable for cash, so we're going to have to keep some cash on hand. But we know that, by and large, you can just pay this money account to account. It doesn't necessarily have to be redeemed in cash except under special circumstances. And so what the banks are effectively doing is monetizing the, uh, the debtors. You know, if, if I have an investment I want finance, the banks are in a position to translate your, your dream, your investment into monetary purchasing power. Everything hinges on the ability of the bank to make good decisions in assessing credit risk. But conditional on assessing, you know, making the correct assessments, the idea of issuing and creating money to facilitate positive net present value projects like yourself, like your education, and holding only a little bit of cash on the side just to, 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 to satisfy the occasional redemptions that come whenever people have to like pull out a $10 bill to pay for a cab ride. There's nothing inherently wrong with that business model in my, my, my view. So, so we have to ask ourselves, you know, what, what is it that you're trying to like, uh, why would people, you asked that you said something, I'm sorry, that if people had access to a full reserve account, that they would never deposit their money in the fractional reserve account. I think that's false. 
The difference between these two accounts is that the fractional reserve account is going to offer you a higher interest rate. So there's going to be a cost-benefit analysis. This high interest rate that the fractional reserve bank is able to charge is a byproduct of the profitable investments it's financing in you and your friends and other positive net present value projects. And so it's not clear to me that, that depositors are going to go flocking to the narrow bank because the narrow bank is going to be, pay a very low interest rate. It'll be safe, but a very low rate of return. And so there's going to be a trade-off. Okay, this is a great point. I guess where, you know, in many people in the Bitcoin space, right, if they kind of look at the, the history of, of banking, right, they, they, they see fractional reserve banking. And correct me if this history is wrong, but it seems like it basically started as a bit of a fraud, right? So people would put in gold, let's say in a bank, and then you give up sort of a, a receipt for the gold, right? And then you could give out, the banker could give out more receipts than you have gold uh, without people necessarily knowing. And, and thus have a bigger business, right? Which is basically uh, what you just described. I, I guess, the, and, and you, I think you're probably right that if you if you had this, this sort of full reserve, like the crypto US dollar, right? Probably still people would create these fractional systems on top of it. But in today's system, right? You don't, see, like in, in that system, it will be transparent, whether you have a, you know a real US dollar which you don't have some kind of you know it doesn't have a dependency on how well a bank has managed its credit portfolio versus you know uh, JP Morgan US dollar which JP Morgan promises you if you go there and bring JP Morgan US dollar they're going to give you like a real US dollar but I mean, you're aware that there's an additional risk there because JP Morgan doesn't have full backing because they issue more JP Morgan US dollars than they have, you know, real dollars. Correct. Well, they, they issue more JP Morgan dollars than they have real dollars, but they don't issue they don't necessarily issue more JP Morgan dollars than they have assets. Right, right. So the whole question, yeah. the whole issue of fragility in the banking sector is the liquidity of these assets. But that's the whole business of banking is to render those illiquid assets liquid. If those assets were already liquid, if your human capital was already liquid, you wouldn't have to use it as collateral for a loan. You could just sell off pieces of yourself, tokenize yourself, little little bits of human capital of you know, Brian and Sebastian claims on your future wages. And you wouldn't have to go and raise money at a bank. So the whole reason of banking is there. To, to overcome these uh, these frictions. Um, you said one other thing. You mentioned that the history of banking is a history of fraud. You have to be careful. Uh, you go look at in history, all sorts of activities are fraudulent. <laughs> Why pick on banking? You know, there's oil and mining is, is fraught with fraud as well. You know, we, we don't ban mining. I mean, we don't, uh, mining exploration. Um, so the, the Goldsmith uh, uh, story that you told is the one that's commonly told in, in, in textbooks, and I, I guess there's some truth to that, but it's an anecdote. You take a look at monetary historians, people like George Selgin or Warren Weber, who've studied these episodes. Go take a look at the Scottish free banking uh, episode in the 1700s. There the banks had, I think, double liability. I mean, the bankers, if, if, their, if their operations went uh, under, they were personally liable to make good on the losses, for example. So it's, it is not tr – and, and that system, uh, arguably, by, by my reading, worked pretty well. So it, it, you have to be careful at kind of reading select anecdotes from your favorite economics textbook and, and, and kind of generalize as to what the historical experience has been for fractional reserve banking. The story is mixed. Was there fraud? Of course there was fraud. There's fraud in every endeavor in history. That's not the issue. Uh, the, the issue is just uh, how did it work? Uh, was it relatively, did it work relatively well or not? And if not, why not? Was it because there's something intrinsically wrong with fractional reserve banking? Or did it interact some way with the existing legislati le legislation that prevented the banks from otherwise op operating from fractional reserve bank from operating in a more stable manner. Sometimes that's a very key part of the equation is the legislation often prevents banks from operating in a way that you might consider uh, in a more prudent manner.
Yeah, I mean, th- th- this uh, this kind of falls into the, to the next topic, um, which is sort of the token of that, tokenization of uh, of liquidity. And uh, you 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 made a great point that a bank's job is is to create value out of things that are illiquid. And I think that to Brian's point, and I think this is what he's sort of alluding to, is and and perhaps you know since the last banking crisis uh, in two thousand eight, people have become aware that banks were um, were were backing debt with uh, with. Uh, illiquid assets, but giving way too much value to these assets uh, with regards to how much they were actually worth. So there was a, a great disparity, a, a, a quite a gap between the under va- the underlying value of an asset and, and what banks were were lending out. And I think this is what has caused you know a lot of the skepticism uh, around banks, uh, sort of generally, and and a lot of the skepticism, I guess, in the Bitcoin space, perhaps because Bitcoin came out around the same time. So, you know, after every financial crisis, people suddenly recognize the problems with banking. The the Federal Reserve was born out of the financial panic of 1907. The U.S. postal savings system was formed in 1911. The postal savings bank that offered small deposits that were fully insured by the government. It was a tremendously popular uh, program. And it came in the aftermath of the panic of 1907. So what you say is true. It's just kind of, in some sense, remarkable that uh, the same sort of mistakes keep on getting repeated. Although, in in some defense, I mean, the the, the crisis, the most recent crisis, did not happen at the retail level. The, the The recent crisis did not really happen in the regulated banking sector. You know. People have deposit insurance. Nobody lost their money in the bank. There were no bank runs. You know, uh, deposit insurance uh, rose to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the United States. The the crisis this time happened in the so-called shadow banking sector, the kind of less regulated, more opaque sector of the economy. But the principle is exactly like what you said, kind of uh, uh, this liquidity mismatch and and also some very bad or questionable investments were made and uh, some questionable ratings were attached to these investments. And and this this all came crashing down, not in the retail sector this time, but in the wholesale sector, but the principle's the same. And now I think what you want to ask is like, what can we do about it? Like, what do these new technologies, how can they kind of mitigate these problems? Well, well, your your blog post, uh, and we'll link to the show, uh, to this post in the show notes. Uh, d- so it describes uh, a, a scenario where one can tokenize um, his own assets. So basically, the, the the job of a bank, or one of the jobs of a bank, is to say, okay, th- these are illiquid assets, and we're going to lend money with those assets as collateral. Uh, but if one could say, okay, this is you know, I'm me. I, I I consider my time to be valuable. My um, my you know uh, experience, and I have these abilities, and so therefore I'm going to use that as collateral um, in in some sort of transaction, or perhaps it's you know uh, physical assets like I've got uh, you know a farm with some cattle or some like some basic example. So maybe yeah, maybe we walk us down this route and um, with this blog post in mind. One thing I love about this whole um, endeavor, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, blockchain, it has, has brought to attention what the fundamental issues are in, in monetary theory. Uh, this idea of money being a ledger, for example, was, you know, nobody, nobody knew what I was talking about when I used to, I, I've been lecturing on this for almost 30 years. <laughs> I preface every one of my monetary theory courses with, you know, why is it when I go to buy a cup of coffee, why why can't I just pay with a personal IOU that represents a claim to the lecture that I'm giving you guys? Yeah. I'm a professor. I give economics lectures. People value that. Why can't I just issue tokens? I didn't, I didn't use the word tokens. I, I used personal IOUs, but it's the same thing. Uh, I should, in principle, be, you know, if it's some sort of famous person, probably they could do it, in fact. But uh, I'm just anonymous. And, and if, I, if I attempted to do so uh, or to issue a claim against my house, for example, uh, suppose I want to buy a cup of coffee in the morning 
you know, a dollar cup of coffee with a one one millionth share of the bathroom of my house. Uh, why can't I do that? The answer is, in economic theory, you can do that. And it's exactly, in a frictionless, frictionless world, that's exactly what you can do. There's no liquidity issues. I mean, if you can use your, if you can use your imagination and just imagine a world where these frictions are absent, you should be exactly able to do what I described. Uh, and so then the question is, is, well, what are the real world frictions that prevent this from happening? Why is it that when I go to the coffee shop and I offer a, a one one millionth slice of my salary as, as payment, why doesn't that work? And, and the answer is, well, first of all, they don't know who I am. They don't know if I'm a professor or not. They, they don't know what sort of claims I'm making. It's very easy to fabricate information. I could be lying and almost surely I might be lying. Second of all, um, even if I'm not lying, what makes anybody think that I would honor the claims of these personal tokens or IOUs? I mean, I claim that my house can generate rental income of $10,000 a year. And I issue a token against that revenue stream. Well, who's going to enforce the payment of that token? Who's going to, who's going to enforce the tenants of my house to pay the rent? I mean, just because I'm recording the ownership on a blockchain or some sort of ledger doesn't magically solve the problem of enforcing payment of the tenant or of enforcing my uh, payment of my set part of my salary to the obligations I've issued. So it doesn't necessarily solve a whole pile of informational frictions that render uh, certain types of capital like your human capital, my human capital, illiquid. That's exactly the job of banks. Banks have credit officers that are specialized to interview you, to go and make an assessment of your home. We trust these, these, these third parties to make accurate assessments of the underlying collateral. Now, they, they often fail, of course. Uh, they don't operate perfectly. But my, my, my question is, how does a decentralized database management system where the data is recorded by in some Merkle tree structure, how is that supposed to solve these underlying frictions of uh, basically enforcing property rights and these kind of uh, informational issues that are associated with the asset that makes the asset illiquid? So I think these are the issues that need to be addressed in this kind of tokenization endeavor. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm still studying it, so maybe, maybe there are some good answers, but I don't know what they are yet. Uh, so this is a very interesting point. I mean, my, uh, I think it is a commonly held view in the blockchain space that exactly one of the things that is being created is that all of those things are becoming much more liquid and that we will go to a world where you have, you know, almost perfectly liquid market. And, you know, to give, give an example, so I, I, you know, once years ago worked a little bit in commodities trading and was dealing with like, you know, the execution of these trades and it's like a complete nightmare and, and, you know, super tedious. And, you know, one of the issues is that you have then, you know, let's say I have a promise of payment if I deliver these goods there, but this is highly liquid, right? So let's say it's a commodity trading company. It has all of these promises of payments but it can't actually sell the individual promises of payments on an open market. It has instead to go to the bank and the bank looks at all of it and it gives you, you know, a loan, which is probably much less than you could get in a liquid market. And now there's many projects, so, you know, to give one example, there's a project called Centrifuge, right? They're trying to take all of, you know, give anybody the ability to put like purchase orders or invoices and stuff like that and immediately sell them, uh, you know, and and so I, I, and then at the same time you have things like prediction markets, right? So you could have maybe liquid markets on information. There's a lot of work that's being done on having exchanges, right? That maybe ha can have um, kind of liquidity and and narrow prices, even on like a large number of you know markets where there's not a big order books and stuff like that. So it does feel to me like we are going to a place where. Okay, it's not going to be perfect liquidity and perfect markets everywhere, but like a massive step in this direction. Do, do you feel that? So did you see that as well? And, and it, let's just assume this actually did end up happening. What would be the consequences of that? Hmm. Well, uh, do I see it happening? Yes, I do see it happening. But, you know, um, I see it happening even kind of an independent of blockchain technology. I mean, it's... Uh, 
uh, what, what you just said was true. Things are becoming more liquid uh, because of the, uh, you know, what renders objects liquid, though? It's enhanced communications, you know, enhanced, uh, you know, security of information, uh, making information more symmetric uh, renders things liquid. And database management systems are can be designed to, to 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 enhance communication between different parties to 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 render you know what's on the books more transparent. These are statements that we can make independent of blockchain. These are just the properties of a database management system in general. The question I have is, uh, you know, when when people say tokenization, they they are specifically meaning um, using a decentralized database structure where the data is recorded in some Merkle tree form and that the, the clearing is undertaken in a decentralized manner by some sort of consensus uh, protocol. That's the part that uh, I have some issue with. Uh, I haven't actually, I, I have a hard time seeing where, uh, apart from the application in terms of like DAOs, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not entirely clear how, decentralized consensus is supposed to enhance the liquidity of an object independent of the other innovations that I'm, I'm speaking of that are occurring even to, even in, you know independently of kind of blockchain kind of considerations and, and I'm sorry you had one more question what what is the limit I mean what what happens as things become more and more liquid I think that what what you'll see is basically a, a gradual disintermediation the whole reason we have intermediaries, like firms or banks or whatever, is is to deal with these issues. Uh, if if we if we go to the limit in a world where everything is fungible, that there's no questions about when I make a promise, it's a good promise that I'm good for it. Uh, at least that it's risk adjusted prices is, is priced correctly. Um, in that sort of world, a lot of the institutions that we see around us, the very existence of corporations and firms would, would cease to exist. There would be no need to organize activity through any intermediary. We could just go about our daily business and be trading, you know, with this. If this is a very futuristic world, uh, but we, w we could, in principle, just undertake uh, all of our economic activities independent of belonging to any particular firm or having a particular bank account at any sort of trusted intermediary. That's what the limit would look like. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think the big the big difference is if you have, let's say, these assets that are issued on this open system, then anybody can, you know, can build things that like interact with each other, right? So for example, you have now this purchase order and somebody can use it on Ethereum to back a loan. And, and it, that doesn't really work if, you know, with normal fintech companies, right? Because well, well, but back up, you know, the, the fact that it's open is something that you don't need blockchain to make a database open. Do you? I think I would disagree with that. Is that right? If I, if I publish my diary online, I can publish my diary online and everybody in the world can download it, that database to their computer. That's effectively a distributed uh, ledger of my life. Yeah, but when, like, who has then the authoritative copy? Or, like, if somebody changes it, you change it retroactively? Or, like, how am I going to rely on that? I have the master copy. I, I print out a new version every day. I, only I can write to it, but I make it open to everybody can read it. You can't go on my blog site right now and change my blog, can you? But everybody in the world can read it. It's a distributed open database. So I don't need blockchain to make a database distributed and open. No, I think I would disagree with that. I mean, in this example, like you're okay, you're publishing your database, right? And I, I can like okay, copy it locally, but now you fiddle with it, you retroactively change something. Yep. Okay, I have the evidence, but someone else has a different record now of the. I mean, blockchain massively gets rid of the coordination problem by okay, there's one authoritative copy. We all know uh, the sequence in which it has been you know, created. Nobody can mess with it. Nobody can. Uh, change it like you can go and change it back like you can go on your website right you can you can pretend you have some blog posts that you wrote a year ago that you didn't actually write a year ago but in a blockchain you wouldn't be able to right so you can i can easily build an application that builds on your data feed without having to worry about like those kind of risks i i think if i could just uh, sort of 
uh, interject here. I think uh, what I think David is right on the on the point that th- this is possible with a blockchain, but it it doesn't scale. And and this is coming back to the, the, my what I was saying earlier about governance. And I guess similarly, one thing that's kind of similar in this sense, where of course you know we can achieve it, but it doesn't scale, is like PGP. So in in the in the eighties and nineties, um, and even today, I mean, you know, sort of cypherpunks and people that are conscious about their security use PGP to send encrypting email. And there is this like web of trust system, and everybody thought that we were going to move to this system uh, to send secure data uh, uh, communications but that system simply doesn't scale because you have to like meet people in person and exchange keys on paper or like verify that you know your key is in fact the one that 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 i have and where blockchain solves some of the issues here is with the scaling aspect so like we can now do this at scale and we're finding solutions where this secure exchange of information that is uh sort of anchored in time uh and where I can go back and, and look at a record and know that that record hasn't been tempered with, this is what blockchain enables. Yeah, so totally agree with what you said. I think that the we can come to a mutual understanding here by uh, understanding that we can, what we're arguing here is the conceptual distinction between the write privilege to a database and the read privilege. I'm talking about the read privilege. So I'm saying, suppose that you trust the writer me, for example. You suppose you trust that I'm not going to go back and fabricate old blog posts. I'm just assuming that. Then there's the question about the read privilege. Can we make it open? And my answer is yes. I don't need a blockchain to make the database open. And in fact, it could work perfectly function. You know, I can be transparent. Uh, I can be honest. Of course, it requires you to trust the writer. Mm. If you don't trust the writer then what you say is absolutely true. What the blockchain enables, the decentralized consensus protocol, permits us to uh, not having to trust the writer either. And that that permits the system to scale in a system where you want open read privileges and you don't trust any single writer to the database. So I think we can reconcile these two. I just wanted to push back that you you don't necessarily need blockchain to make a database open and transparent was my point. Yeah, I I think also... So I think I think you're right, but what 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 blockchain also does to a large extent is it it allows you to forego having to even think about whether or not you trust someone. And oh, so sure. as as we enter um, and as we live in, in in a society where our data is free flowing on all types of systems, and we have interactions, whether financial or purely uh, uh, on a communication basis with, you know, dozens, uh, hundreds of of entities every day, the blockchain sort of allows you to forget about the trust issue. You you know, you you don't have to think about whether or not I want to trust someone or whether or not that exchange is genuine. And and it sort of takes that that, that out of the equation to some extent. Trust. (laughs) I I want to push back a little bit. Uh, I know where you're coming from and I kind of agree. But on the other hand, I don't think that's exactly true. Uh, you still have to, if I'm using blockchain for the first time, I have to, I have to enter it with some degree of trust. I, mean, I, I can't read C++ code. I don't know the cryptography behind anything. How do I trust? This is true. This is true. How, how do I trust that my automobile is going to get me to work safely? I don't know how the internal combustion engine works in detail. The way the trust happens is we, on the basis of experience. And so if it turns out the blockchain kind of renders very good user experience, people will come to trust it. But the exact same tr- thing is true of my bank. <laughs> so the question is really, where do you want to place your trust, I think, as, as opposed to not having to think about it? Of course. Yeah. Uh, so th- th- this is all very fascinating. I think we, sh- we could go on for <laughs> for hours here, uh, but we're very conscious of your time. And uh, so before we wrap up, I just maybe want to get your final thoughts on you know, where you know, if you if you look forward uh, 10 years from now, um, and so the, at the rate at which the space is growing and at the way that, rate at which government entities, central banks are now changing their, uh, or so, not, not changing, but uh, sort of observing these technologies and perhaps experimenting with them or 
Um, from your perspective, where where do we can we expect things to be in the next ten years? Well, wow, that's this is tough, right? I mean, you're not going to hold me to any of this, but uh... <laughs> no, but we could use a prediction market to come up, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, I, I see basically more of the same in terms of the innovations in fintech and database management, and I think that central banks will have to be increasingly on guard, I think, to, um, you know, to make sure that they are managing their policies in, in, a, in a socially responsible manner. And that I actually view this emergent class of technologies as, as kind of useful in terms of like disciplining banks, uh, central banks, in kind of incentivizing them to kind of really look for kind of the use value that they can deliver society. And if at the end of the day, they can't, they can't uh, pass that market te test, they should probably disappear. I don't, I don't know if that's going to, that's not going to happen in the next 10 years. But the other thing I think I would look for is, um, again, uh, going back to what we alluded to earlier is this, this issue of decentralized autonomous organizations. I, I can envisage very, very rapid, spontaneous growth in that, in that d dimension uh, along very, Various aspects, and I, I think this is going to give regulators uh, and policymakers headaches, endless headaches, because I don't think it's something they can necessarily. You know, they're not going to be able to control, and that makes uh, regulators very, very nervous. Um, and, and maybe it's good, uh, but I can also see um, some dangers. Uh, as, and we don't. We could spend another episode, I guess, uh, discussing what those might be. But it's going to be very interesting, I think. I think you're just going to see uh, that DEO space uh, develop very rapidly and with it kind of the discussions by policymakers wringing their hands about what, what can be done about it, what's the proper uh, policy, public policy to take, public policy view to take on these issues. Great. Well, I mean, uh, I guess we can, uh, we can say that we'll have you back on again. Uh, in, I hope in, in less than three years, though. <laughs> with, with with pleasure. Uh, so uh, do come back anytime. Uh, we'd, we'd love to talk to you again about all these things and sort of follow the trends with regards to central banks and uh, you know how they're experimenting or thinking at least where the research is going in this topic. Yeah. It's a fascinating topic. It's a lot, been a lot of fun. Always fun talking to you guys. Likewise. Thanks very much Absolutely. for coming on today, Thanks David. so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guest, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.